Maran Yaria, Nadu Yinjimara, Kulin Mai, Nadu Yinjimara, Wurundjeri, Nurumbang. In my language, Wurundjeri, I want to pay my respects to the people of the Kulin Nation and the land of the Wurundjeri people where we meet tonight. What do Willy Wonka and James Bond have in common? Well, they're both being rewritten. What offends you and do you have the right to shut other voices down? Let's introduce our panel to discuss this. British playwright David Hare, who's in Australia for the Adelaide Writers' Festival. <laughs> Liberal Senator for New South Wales, Andrew Bragg, who has a lot to say about the government's superannuation changes. <laughs> Author and behavioural scientist, Pragya Agarwal, who is taking part in Sydney's All About Women's event this Sunday. <laughs> Assistant Minister for the Republic and Assistant Minister for Defence, Matt Thistlethwaite. And Viradjuri and Wild One, lawyer, Teela Reid, who's also appearing at All About Women, whose voice speaks loudest when we tell stories. You can live stream us around the country on iView and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. And please get involved in our online poll tonight. We're asking you, is it ever OK to edit an author's work as social values change? And now, cast your votes on our Facebook and Twitter accounts, and we're going to bring you those results a little bit later. We're also going to be discussing a bit later politicians and the pub test, whether you can believe politicians and whether they should be held to account for what they say. So let's get started tonight. Here's our first question from Bob Stewart. Bob? Yeah, I have a question uh, mainly for David, but I'm sure the panel would, would like to answer it in total. Uh, we, we all know that in recent times, a number of publication houses have decided to rewrite books, and in one case, a children's book, a famous children's book. We also find that television stations go through their old catalogues and decide to erase certain programs and episodes because they don't form to community standards. And, of course, Gone with the Wind now comes with a warning uh, for people who want to view it. Uh, my question is, why is this happening? And if it continues, will it undermine one of our most fundamental human rights, which is the right to free speech? David. Well, it's happened in every generation. In the 18th century, Nahum Tate, who was a famous actor, said that it wasn't acceptable for King Lear to end tragically, and he gave King Lear a happy ending. <laughs> uh, Cordelia didn't die, King Lear didn't die, and the whole thing ended. So we now laugh at him, and when I was young, we all laughed at him, and at, at, with the condescension of history, we said this was totally ridiculous. Why do we not imagine that in 100 years' time we will not be thought to be equally ridiculous, and that the things that we censored seemed absurd? So, as a playwright, and a, I'm, my bias is always in favour of freedom. It always has to be. I always want freedom and see very, very few reasons to shut it down. I personally would never write a word where I supported the power less against the power full. And I am offended when I see that, but on the other hand, I don't know that I would wish to shut it down. And so, in those circumstances, yeah, I, I always want freedom. And that means not rewriting Roald Dahl, and it also means not having this ridiculous attempt to uh, boycott Adelaide Writers' Week, which is just absurd. Not to allow Palestinians to speak in this country is just, you know, to me, repellent. And we, we, we are going to get to that issue as well. Tilo. Should things be... What, what do you do with things, things that have been written when they land so awkwardly or offensively in the age today rather than when they were written? Well, I think it's important to remember, you know, free speech is not an unlimited right um, as much as we do embrace it. I think the situation that we've seen here um, and the question I had alluded to sends a bigger signal, I think, to Australi Australian publishing houses. Um, you know, when it comes to First Nations stories um, and storytelling our way and the written word, language absolutely matters. Language has been weaponised against our people. And when it comes to 
books or stories that are told about us. It should be with us and by the people who have authority to tell those stories as well. I mean, you know, there's an example um, in the last few years recently, I won't name the, the publishing house or I won't name the book, but um, there were stories written about First Nations women by other First Nations women. And there are a lot of titter girls online who really called out that publishing house away around the way in which those stories were told. I think there's a, there's a mm. different issue in our communities about who has the authority to tell stories. And I think a prime example of an excellent, amazing publishing house that we can learn a lot from is Magabala Books in mm. Broome. I think they're, they're a really great publishing house. But Bob, I sense that you, you suspect that there is danger in this age, do you? Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, I think there are a number of enemies of free speech out there that we forget about. And if I can just remind the panel, I think that government is an enemy of free speech. Religious institutions are enemies of free speech. Big business has become an, energy, uh, an enemy of free speech. A large segment of the arts and entertainment industry has become an enemy of, uh, of free speech. And even sports organisations have become enemies of free speech by uh, selecting certain social causes that mm. they impose on those who attend their um, sporting contests. So I just wonder whether or not I'm on the right track mm. here by seeing a, uh, not a conspiracy, but uh, a convenient attempt by these big, big, powerful organisations that in the end, when it comes to the crunch, they want less mm. free speech for us average citizens than more. Pragya. Um, I think the important issue here is uh, what do we mean by free speech and who has the freedom to speak in our society and who's had the freedom to speak historically and whose voices have been heard or not. Um, I think with the issue of Roald Dahl, um, as you said, David, books have always been rewritten. Um, what we really need to focus on is the broader issue around inclusive language and how children can pick up and everybody, all of us, can pick up biases and prejudices from language and how language shapes our view of society. I do think that these kind of gestures of rewriting books can be quite tokenistic and performative, and they can detract from the broader structural and systemic issues so that what, we really need to focus on. What do we do then with things that were written in another time that don't speak to this time? I think there is a really big need to have a broader discussion around children's stories and publishing, around who's being represented, not just children's stories, but broader issue in publishing about whose stories are being told. Maybe for in this specific case, I think we could have an, had a foreword explaining mm. it to parents and educators and children. We could have a supplementary material to help people navigate these things. Uh, we could put these resources and time and energy into developing more contemporary authors from marginalized societies, marginalized communities who've not had the opportunity or don't of have the opportunity to tell their stories. So I think there is a need to discuss a broader thing about the systemic inequalities and how language shapes mm. bias and prejudice in our and society. And can I just add to that amazing point, which is, you know, in this country, on this continent, we should be telling more stories about First Nations history and the truth of that. And that's really important, not just for First Nations children, but for all Australian kids to understand the ancient story and the ancient sovereignty here on this land and where we come from. Well done. We're going to continue this topic. Let's go to Maureen Hovey now. Sponsors have, uh, uh, over the past years, withdrawn from public forums where uh, extremist or diverse views are being expressed. Is there a more active and constructed option, a constructive option, to to address the issue and, and create respect for diversity and minimise extremism. I'll bring that back to you, Dave, because you did touch on the, um, the Adelaide Writers' Festival and there was an attempt, wasn't there, then later, to disqualify you from another event because you were at Adelaide Writers' Festival, is that right? Yeah, there's a chain of contamination, apparently. <laughs> there's some writers that I've never heard of. To my shame, I should have heard of them, but I had never heard of them. I had never met them. I had never ever heard, heard them speak, I had never seen them, and yet because I was taking part in one event 
at which they were invited, there were lobbyists who were ringing New the University of New South Wales saying, can you shut down David Hare and the Poet Laureate? Can you shut down Simon Armitage as well? So there is apparently a chain of contamination, which may, they may now want the air, airline that brought these people into. Uh, you know, they may want that shut down. Or they may want the dentist who drills the teeth of these people. They may want that surgery <laughs> shut down. How far is this contamination business going to go? It's just completely ridiculous. And so I do think that if you go to the Middle East, if you go to Israel, if you go to Palestine, People are not concerned about language. What they are concerned about is what people do. The Israelis are concerned about people who walk into markets with um, suicide bomb belts around their neck, and they're concerned about innocent people getting killed. And the Palestinians are concerned about the cruelty of the occupation. If you speak to Palestinians, if you speak to Israelis, as I have often done, they will speak in language which really Puts, it burns the hair off your back of your neck. It would be so completely unacceptable to quote here today the stuff I have heard in the Middle East. Because, of course, they live with the problem. And because they live with the problem, they are free to talk about it. We are miles and miles away from the problem. And for that reason, we develop this absurd over touchiness about it. And I have to point out. <laughs> we, um... I, t I, I take the point, David, we don't have anyone from either of those communities on our panel tonight, so I don't want to have a conversation without them being at the table either. But I do want to go to the politicians on this. Um, and, and, Matt, where is the line drawn here between what is... Um, what, what can be offensive speech and still allowable and also people who take offence at that and demand that they be protected from that? What is the role in a very contested society now of things like writers' festivals? It's a tough one. I think that we should try and uh, limit censorship within the bounds of the law. So I'm not comfortable with rewriting authors' works um, without their consent, particularly republishing it under their name without their consent. And I think that those publications can provide an opportunity to educate, particularly younger generations, about what might have been used as language in the past that is no longer appropriate, um, to explain particularly to younger children uh, that that sort of language is no longer appropriate, that it can be hurtful, it can be disrespectful to people, and most importantly, that if you hear someone use that sort of language, you're well within your rights to call it out and to speak up about it. So I think that, uh, that um, authors like that can be used as a tool for education of the next generation. Uh, Andrew... Just bringing it back, um, bring it back to, to Maureen's question, and, and the point that Maureen was making here is that is there another way, a more active and constructive option mm. for dealing with diverse views when those diver diverse views are going to land in very different ways with different people? Well, Stan, I think historically, uh, over the past 250 years in this country, there has been a dom domination uh, of one culture over others. And if you look at our public buildings and our artworks and our statues, for example, there is a huge imbalance there. But the answer, in my mind, isn't to burn old books or change them or to pull down statues. It's to write new books uh, which put that into context and explain that history and, ex <laughs> and, ex and explain why that was wrong. And part of the other answer is to build new statues of... People And as you know, when they uh, unveiled the statue of John Gorton in Canberra a couple of years ago uh, and his dog, there were then more statues of dogs than there were of women or Indigenous people mm. yeah. uh, in Canberra, a capital city. So uh, I think we have a long way to go in rebalancing things, but I don't think the answer is burning old things. Can I... <laughs> Can I just add to that? Um, I think the question about... Uh, cancelling things, which is a big word at the moment, cancel culture. Um, we have to be careful about um, any views that are harming marginalised communities, people who are on the fringes, who are already facing oppression. And we need to think about whether they have a voice at all or not, mm. because often these kind of discussions or debates happen without bringing 
those people in. Mm. They don't have a voice. They don't have a platform. So any views that harm them or further that oppression can be harmful. And to add to your brilliant point, yes, I think we need to be very aware and honest about our history, a past. And mm. history has also been written by powerful people who've had the voice, who've had the power. So we need to be honest about our past. And unless we do that and unless we confront our past, we cannot really move forward in an honest way. And I think context matters yeah. in this debate um, and conversation in terms of uh, the voices that come to the table when, you know, writers' festivals or particularly mm. creative spaces, which I've been involved in a lot lately with Blackfella Book Club, um, you know, the festival last year here at in Melbourne, Melbourne, Melbourne uh, Writers' uh, After the Queen's death, and you were meant to be discussing the monarchy, right? Yes. And so it didn't happen. Um, you know, I'd flown in and there were the Queen passed away um, and we were, within the next 24 hours, supposed to have a panel on the monarchy and the republic and have a conversation about that. And I think it's one thing for parliament to suspend parliament. It's an entirely different thing in the context, I think, of a writer's space to stifle that debate and silence it. And for someone who... <laughs> For someone who is very passionate about democracy and the future of our nation, I thought that this was a very critical conversation. So many people that wanted to be at the table and have the conversation about Australia's future and our future as a republic were supposed to be part of that panel, but had, you know, I was outnumbered in terms of wanting it to go ahead. And I think we are mature as Australians. We are having a very important national conversation now. But in terms of the uh, Australian republic, Public, it must start with a conversation about First Nations sovereignty. Mm. It must start with the fact that we have never ceded sovereignty to our land. And those are the kind, kinds of conversations, I think, that we can't stifle both ends of those debate in silence at such a critical point in our yeah. history. And it was interesting, Matt Thistlethwaite, at the time, because when I recall, the Prime Minister was saying at the time, well, now's not the time for the conversation, or there should be a more appropriate time. Was that the right move or should it have been? Was that, in fact, the appropriate time? I think it was the right move from the government and the Prime Minister. It was out of respect for the Queen uh, and the role that she'd played as our Head of State um, and, indeed, as to not, the... To not have conversations about colonisation, empire and the monarchy? Well, that, that's up to organisations that put on those events. Um, they've got to reflect... Uh, the views of the Australian population, and I think that. And this is at where First point Nations' time, point of views need to come and have the seat at the table in relation to these conversations. We're entitled to have them um, in a mature way. I think that we're ready to have the conversation. <laughs> and I think that, you know, um, you're the Minister for the Republic, I live in your electorate. Um, Maybe I'll campaign against you at the next election to, <laughs> to, to get the Republic on the table because I think, you know, we, we really need to reimagine our nation. And a nation, you know, yes, the Queen has now passed. We're, we're writing a new chapter as we speak. Um, there's no reason why the first president of our country can't be a black First Nations woman. Mm. Um, we're ready for it. Well, we're we're, we're going to keep this conversation going because it does lead to our next question, which comes from Alessandro Rossini. Thank you, Stan. My question is to the Assistant Minister for the Republic. With inflation at an all-time high, an increasingly contested Indo-Pacific and a cost-of-living crisis like no other, why is the government using taxpayers' money to fund a national listening tour on the Republic, insisti insisting on a further expensive referendum and prosecuting a change to a system that is working so well? Thanks for the question. Um, no doubt the government's priority is co easing, easing cost of living pressure for Australians and all of the policies that we've been focusing on and releasing have been aimed at easing that cost of living pressure. But in terms of the government's longer term vision for our nation, um, it involves a discussion with the Australian people about importantly recognising First Nations Australians in our constitution. That deep historical cultural and spiritual the connection. The question here, though, was about the Republic, which you're also overseeing. Why would yeah. you be getting that process when there's already a process underway, as Tula pointed out, the First Nations voice? Because we have a longer-term vision for Australia. This year will be about the voice. 
recognising First Nations people in our constitution uh, and delivering a voice to parliament. But over the longer term, we see Australia as a mature, independent nation, making its own way in the world, reflecting our true multiculturalism, our unique culture and identity by having one of our own as our head of state in the future. And the current system that we have is the complete antithesis of our democracy. We woke up uh, in September last year when the Queen passed away, and all of a sudden we had a new head of state. The Australian people weren't consulted about that. The Australian people didn't get a choice in who should be their head of state, despite the fact that we govern by democratic means. So we believe it's the right time to begin a discussion with the Australian people. We're going to let the voice have its space this year, um, and we'll focus on that. But at the same time, I'm working with multicultural communities in particular, with younger Australians, to hear their views about uh, the Republic, whether or not they believe it's something that we should pursue and how we can do it into the future. One of the concerns that Alessandro had <laughs> was, um, was the money that's being spent. How much is this costing? It's You're... costing next to nothing. So, which, is, which is what? I'm the in, assistant... in political terms, well, next to nothing could really be anything. nothing, because I'm the Assistant <laughs> Minister uh, for Defence and Veterans Affairs as well. Um, I don't get any additional staff uh, for the work that I have on the Republic. And the consultations that I'm doing around the country, I'm usually tacking on to my work as the Assistant Minister for Defence and Veterans Affairs. So my work is costing the taxpayer very little. But we are beginning that conversation with the Australian people about our future and about recognising our independence and our maturity as a nation in the future. Um, I'm not Australian. Um, I come from England slash Ireland. So I find this conversation really interesting, looking at Australia, what's happening here, and how you're trying to forge a new identity. And these are similar some of the conversations we've been having in England, for instance, about the role of monarchy and what the royal family stands for, and how do you actually deal with the history of colonialism, and how do we come to terms with it and acknowledge the past and actually talk about it in an honest and open way. Whether we need the monarchy or not, what it, is it for? What is it doing for us? And I think it's really good that we, you're having this conversation around um, trying to forge an identity uh, which reconciles with the past, with the colonialism, and moves forward um, dealing with the monarchy and its role in Australia today. And the Irish were, they were, they were Irish Twitter and Blackfella Twitter yeah. were very, um, very alike when... <laughs> oh, it was when, fascinating. Yes, yeah. it was very fascinating. Um, but I think there's a bigger conversation yeah. here, Stan, in terms of process and referendums. And um, I can see, on the one hand, what the government are trying to give to do, given that we're a nation that doesn't necessarily like change. Mm. We're a nation that's a bit stuck in well, the ice age. Referendums are particularly and hard And referendums in particular are very difficult. I think, actually, we should see this as a potential investment in our democracy. Um, Irish... Ireland, for example, have an entire infrastructure around referendum processes. Um, in Barbados, they just, you know, become republic, but their model was to have a prime minister and a president. Mm. Um, I think these are actually really important investments in our um, bigger picture. I think change are. is always uncomfortable because our brains don't want to acknowledge change and accept change. Well, uh, Alexandra, I think one of the main points here is that um, referendums are very difficult to pass. Uh, the one on it's the table... Because politicians make it difficult. So... <laughs> Um, at the moment, there's one on, on the table. Uh, Matt is flagging another one in a future term. Uh, one of the reasons I'm a supporter of the voice concept is... And a, and, and a republic, is that right? Well, but I don't think it's a priority right now. But, but you do support oh, the yeah, idea of Australia becoming a republic. It, but the, the point I was going to make is, one of the reasons I think the voice is such a good idea is because I think the country needs new institutions. Uh, we... I don't think that the country needs new institutions in relation to our overall governance. Uh, so, but I think there's a very strong case for The Voice to help close we, the gap and do a whole lot of other we things. Are, we are going to explore yeah. The Voice. But Alessandro's got his hand up. You want to...? I, I, I find it, I guess, a bit perplexing, the assertion that 
to become a mature nation or to be a mature nation that we have to become a republic or that it's somehow less Australian to be a constitutional monarchy. I guarantee if you went out there to like the everyday Australian and said, oh, becoming, uh, w will you feel more Australian if we made a politician president? Um, I can guarantee you a majority of people would probably say no. Indeed, on Anzac Day, perhaps one of our most important national days, if you went up to our veterans who have sworn allegiance to the reigning monarch of the day and said, do you feel less Australian because you've sworn allegiance to the king or queen today on Anzac Day? I guarantee you most of them would turn around and say, well, look at the flag that's on my left hand shoulder. It's the Australian flag. I'm very proud to be Australian and becoming a republic isn't going to make us more well, Australian. How do people in the room feel about that? <laughs> If you, if you want to put your hands up, and Alessandro is saying he doesn't think that most people would say yes, they want to do that. How, how do you feel about a republic now? Hands up? In favour? And against? <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Pro, pro republic. OK, now it goes up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But can I say something? Can, 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 I'll country plug in a minute, but go to. Well, where, 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 where is England right now? Well, because I'm very touched by everybody's <laughs> faith in referendum. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a referendum this. in Britain, which has been the yeah. biggest political disaster of my lifetime. Yes, yes. And <laughs> Brexit. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're very, very bad at referendum. And, uh, you know, we're poorer. We're more bitter. Yeah. We're more divided. We're angrier. We're unhappier. And we're much, much poorer. And that is a result of a decision taken in a referendum. I, my, myself, uh, have, believe it or not, have faith in the process of democratic politics. And I'd like to see people leading for exactly the ideas you're talking about. I'd like to see them elected, and I'd like to see them leading um, the conversation. Because I, I, I don't trust the referendum uh, after our very, very bitter experience of a referendum in England, which now, I may say, and I'm not speaking personally for one side or another, most of the public now regret. Uh, it's just statistical that something like 60 to 65 per cent of people feel that the, vote, the Brexit vote was a mistake, which it, you know, clearly was. Yeah, I think Brexit, I was going to say the same thing. The Brexit was a disaster and it was the people voting for it. Um, but it depends whether the people are really informed about what the situation is and how it's going to impact their lives or mm. not. I don't think that was the case there then, that they really knew the consequences. And I don't, I don't believe that it's the case here that the common Australians or judge people know what that, that would ha have the impact on their lives we or not. So I think that is a broader conversation to have before you go forward with something. We, 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 we just hold the thought because we are going to come back to questions of referendum. But Alessandro, thank you for that. We'll move on now, though, and have a question from Phil Duff. OK, thanks, Dan. Just some context uh, for this, uh, this question. Uh, in this morning's news poll, 64% of Australians said that they support the government's approach to the changes to superannuation. Of those, coalition voters, 54% approve that change. But what I don't understand, Andrew Bragg, is why or why do you keep insisting that this money is people's own money when clearly that's just not true? Well, thanks, Phil. I mean, it is their money. That's the whole point of super, and it's been taken from people's salaries and wages and put into super. So um, I believe, though, that the government has decided to do this as a precursor to other tax changes. So rather than um, junking their off-balance sheet items like the reconstruction fund and uh, banking the commodity price uh, windfall that their budget is receiving, they've decided to raise taxes. And we don't think that raising taxes is, is the right approach. Well, the po but the, the people, according to the polling, um are certainly approving of it at the moment well, we when, don't it come, when it comes to super. Yeah, well, we don't think taxing uh, Australian people is the right approach. And, you know, you are pulling the rug from underneath people. The people that will pay this the most will be younger Australians. So uh, over half a million Australians will be captured by this tax in the longer term. And the government admitted today that it will capture actually 10% of all Australians over the long term. So uh, we think it's a bad idea to introduce a new tax. And it's a tax that's very unusual. I mean, it would be applying to unrealised gains. And we also don't know whether it would apply to the five cabinet ministers uh, that are on defined benefit schemes. So there, there are many questions about this new tax. Let, let me put some of those questions to you, Matt, this is right. And the fir first, first one is that um, 
this was not something you went to the election um, seeking a mandate to do. But we are taking it to the next election. Uh, and I think that the Australian people will have the opportunity to have their say on it at the next election. This policy, if it, when it kicks in, uh, won't kick in till 1 July 2025. So the Australian people will have the opportunity to vote on it. Um, look, I spoke to a woman in my electorate last week um, who's a single mum, uh, raising a child uh, with a disability, renting. Um, she was phoning me because the landlord had put the rent up by $200 a week. Um, and she was saying she just can't afford it. She was approaching me because she wanted my assistance with getting into public housing. And unfortunately, I had to tell her I can do that to help you. But the waiting list for public housing in New South Wales is eight to 10 years. Um, now, that's heartbreaking that I have to tell someone that. This government has priorities. Uh, all governments have to have priorities about the way they spend taxpayers' dollars. Our priorities are to try and help people, like the woman in that situation, by investing in more public housing, by our, our help to buy scheme to help people get into the housing market. But you have to fund those if that, policies. If that's the and case, we, though... We want to do that by making modest changes to superannuation that only affect 0.5% of superannuation holders, uh, about 80,000 people, um, who have balances of more than $3 million. Now, we believe that that is a modest change that is reasonable and that will ensure that we are able to afford those priorities that we want if for the Australian people. If that's the case, there's also, um, there's also an ongoing commitment to honest stage three tax cuts, which are going to give a huge windfall to people earning the highest incomes in the country. Why don't you scrap those? Well, we don't have any plans to change those. But, but if you're concerned about the people that you talked about, why wouldn't you take the money that's going to flow to the richest and redistribute that? Well, you have to do what we think is, is achievable. Um, and we went to the last election um, committing to deliver those tax cuts that have already been legislated. But you also went um, to the election saying you wouldn't be looking at taxes, and here you are talking about taxes on super. Very good point. Why wouldn't you walk away from stage three if that indeed is going to mean you'll have more money to support the people that you said you care about. Because, because we have to make decisions um, and make balanced decisions about what we think we think is achievable. Um, and we did go to the last election pledging to deliver what have been legislated tax cuts. See, we'd, we'd have to go and unwind what have been legislated tax cuts. Um, the difference with superannuation, uh, I think, is that it's a modest change that we are taking to the next election and the people will have the opportunity to, uh, to make a, a call on it. I'll just go back to Andrew Bragg quickly on this. Um, you, you were the ones in your, your government that instituted just these types of tax cuts for the rich. Um, why w isn't there an acknowledgement now that tax does need to be changed and that we have to look at tax reform in this country if we're able to, to be able to meet our spending demands into the future? Well, the government's spending $45 billion on off-balance sheet items. They're spending $15 billion on the reconstruction fund, which is a massive slash fund for unions. Uh, and in addition, they're not showing any fiscal restraint. You've got spending... At so you don't think it's necessary to look at tax reform? You've got record spending at the moment. So the government's got to pull... They're not doing anything to try and help the Reserve Bank uh, curb inflation. Uh, the government is massively fueling inflation in this country, and that is hurting uh, everyone because the Reserve Bank it, it, is, is raising interest rates because the government won't do its job. But the Reserve well, Andrew, Bank you know that the, government, uh, the, the Reserve Bank makes spending too decisions much money. independent of, spending too of much. government... Um, and we're showing restraint in spending. Any Hang revenue on. that's coming into the budget... You're raising taxes. 99% of it, 99% of it is being reinvested in the budget compared to only 30% when you're in government. We're showing restraint. We're making sure that we're providing <laughs> cost of living relief for Australians, but we're doing it in a manner that doesn't fuel inflation, and that is the key, trying to get inflation down because it's eating in to the wages of working Australians, and it's making life difficult for the average Australian worker and family and pensioner. If you're just... Um, thank you. You're, you're allowed to clap. <laughs> if, you, if, you if you're just want. joining us, you're watching Q&A. We're live with David Hare, Andrew Bragg, Pragya Agarwal, Matt Thistlethwaite and Tila Reid. Our next question is on the RoboDebt Royal Commission. It's a video from Dusan Milojevic. Hello. Question to the panel. 
So decision makers, be it elected representatives like stewardrobots or appointed bureaucrats, be protected from legal responsibility. It is not for the first time that through the work of journalists and institutions like our commission, a plethora of attitudes that do not pass pub test is unmasked. What should be done to bring those responsible to account in a more substantive way than a few hours grilling at the Royal Commission? Andrew Bragg. Well, Dusan, thank you for your question. And I understand that the RoboDebt scheme has caused many people great anguish. And it's you know, hugely disappointing to see government schemes cause people so much sadness. Um, the, que the question the was, reason... though, why, why Stuart Robert at the time was going around supporting the scheme, even when he had concerns about it, because he believed that that was his duty as a minister. The question goes to how can politicians be trusted when they will say things that they know not to be true? Well, I mean, obviously, that's not what you should be doing. I mean, if you're in these jobs, you should be uh, being square with people about what the true picture is. And uh, it's very similar to the conversation we had about our history. I mean, you've got to be honest about our history. There is good and there is bad. Uh, but in relation to these matters, I believe that they were concocted in order to try and improve the overall budget position. And I think one of the lessons is that this is not a very good way to fix a budget. Uh, I think we need to do the things I mentioned just only a moment ago, um, show fiscal restraint um, and look, look to, to bank windfall gains that come Yeah, but the question positive. here is, is not about that. The question was, what should be done to bring those responsible to account? So what can be done? so that politicians can't lie and get away with it. Well, I mean, obviously... Obviously, we already have... I mean, I've always been a supporter of the Integrity Commission, which we now have, and one of the things that frustrated me in the discussion about that institution being created was that people acted as if there were no other institutions. I mean, we have parliamentary processes like the Estimates Committees, where people are held to account. There's the Auditor General. But now you have the Integrity Commission. I mean, people are free to make referrals and people can be dragged in front of the Integrity I Commission. Th I think Australians are really fed up, <laughs> honestly. Like... <laughs> everyday citizens in this country have had to watch and observe Parliament and, you know, your leader, Andrew, he had how many portfolios that none of you even knew about? We like, didn't know about that, did we? Well, it's just, honestly... <laughs> that was a... That, that, no, but, that, no, that, no, that was let, the let me, great let me finish, let me finish. The, when, if we're talking about integrity and our political representatives representing the public interest, um, I think there does need to be a level of scrutiny and more, I think, accountability in this space. Australians are tired mm. of what we're seeing happening down in Parliament House. And it's the same in the UK, David, here, isn't it? I mean, you must well, look, look there I and mean, you we've see had, uh, uh, what, We've had eight governments in mm. 13 years. <laughs> uh, we've had five prime ministers. One of those prime ministers, when elected, had twice been sacked from jobs for lying. <laughs> he had been sacked from... He had been sacked by Rupert Murdoch, for God's sake, <laughs> for lying. How difficult is that? And he'd actually been sacked from The Times for making up quotes. And he'd also been sacked by his party leader for lying about an affair that he was having. He was asked straight, are you having this affair? He said, no, I am not having this affair. He was later found out to have this affair. And yet, and yet and people yet still vote. Voted so why? in as a pathological liar to lead our country through Brexit. So what's the appeal? If people are voting for them... <laughs> you, you did say earlier, uh, David, that you trust the democratic because, process. No, That's the democratic process. I, I do trust the democratic process, <laughs> but people reached in Britain a stage of disillusion with parliamentary politics that came out of a, hit, a whole series of histories, historical things. Iraq, which we were consistently lied to about the invasion of Iraq, we were then... The public were furious about the financial crisis because the financial crisis was entirely caused by the banks, entirely the responsibility of the banks. Nobody was prosecuted, nobody went to prison, and the people who suffered were innocent people who had absolutely nothing to do with the financial crisis. I think... and, 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 and in, in, in Britain, these two things together created a massive distrust in... Uh, elected politics. 
which nobody has yet been able mm. to restore to its former and, trust. And, and, and Pragya, if you look around the world, you know, the political populism that we see that often plays to fear or anxiety or, the, or, or, or those instincts is rewarded. You've written about shame and you think there's a loss of or, or a lack of shame in our public culture. Absolutely. And I was going to follow up on that point to say that not uh, Britain, British people are tired as well. Um, so we have something in common with you all. Um, but <laughs> I think the, the problem is that the politicians um, create an, a culture of partisan politics and they politicize or weaponize some of the issues which create rift in society. And as you say, it, it's built on the notion of fear and anxiety of in-group and out-group associations. Mm. So when we say that these people are going to come in to take your job, immigration is a big issue mm. in the Britain, about people coming in, they're going to take your job, they're going to change lifestyle. And that creates this notion of fear of outsiders, which outweigh all the other things things and and that is why people still go and vote for for these politicians because they think they're going to protect their culture and there's it also comes back to this notion of what is british identity and who's mm. british as well um yes the the lack of shame in politicians is is really concerning um and i think as you said there has to be a culture where we actually talk actively about we voted for these politicians, and how do we hold them accountable? We're going to go to our next topic now. We'll hear from Lee Joachim. Yeah, hi. Hi, Lee. I <laughs> um, just want to acknowledge my Yorta Yorta elders, both past, present, and respect to those that are coming up. Yorta Yorta. Um, in, in, since 1788, you know, we've been continually forced to conform to colonisation. This, this has had large effects in regards to loss of knowledge and loss of our language. I mean, moving forward, how do we protect our cultural heritage and, more importantly, that oral history and that written history um, that we possess? And how do we, you know, have control over that? Tila. Thank you so much for your question. Um, in relation to, you know, particularly our oral history, I think that's something that Australians generally every day don't understand, that our laws are passed down orally through ceremony, through art. Um, and, you know, I don't practise in the area of IP law, but over the period of time, especially growing up in Rudgery country, you know, my ancestors were shunned, were punished for speaking their language. And, you know, Uncle Stan Senior has, has really enlivened our languages. And I think it's so important that we um, speak it and we live it. And it's so much part of who we are as an identity. We, we had an experience, didn't we, recently? I'll speak personally here yeah. now because um, Teela and I spent some time back on our country with our people. And to hear our language spoken um, really is a strong sense of... It gives you a strong sense of belonging and place. How are we doing... Just to go to Lee's question, Teela, how do we do that from the ground up? Mm. And now with the voice, and maybe we can reflect on that here, how that can assist in this. Yeah, well, it's exactly what we were experiencing, mm. the nation building happening on our nation, on our country. It's so powerful. And, you know, I look at the kids in my kinship now and there are lots of different ways in which they are able to connect and speak their language. I've got a little, you know, niece and nephew and they're arguing in Wurundjeri now. I just think that <laughs> every way possible that we should learn to absolutely embrace First Nations languages as the first storytellers and, you know, if you want to link it back to something like the moment that we're all walking through with, with respect to the invitation um, at the heart of the Uluru Statement, you know, politicians dumb it down to a uh, debate on detail when, in fact, actually, what's standing right there in front of them is the nation was gifted the Jukupa law in the artwork around it by the Anangu people. Like, how powerful is that? And so I think, you know, we need to see our languages, um, the many different that you know, that are, you know, yoda yoda get spoken across the continent, mm. be valued at the centre of who we are on a national identity. Can I just ask you, Lee, what, what's happening in, in your community and what yeah. change you've seen around language and the impact it has? Well, it, it's been introduced into the education system, yeah. but it, it's community are feeling that it's been taken away from them. Again. You know, it's different in New South Wales where there's mm. been a big 
push in regards to bringing the community along for the ride. Mm. And, and this is what, you know, we need to achieve here. Yeah. But we need to support our, our mothers, our brothers and our sisters in, in learning that and, and supporting the kids through that process and the yeah. rest of Australia through that process. And you've given the process. example that different experiences are happening on the mm. ground with the different nations. I know I feel very privileged as a Wiradjuri woman is that we have a like an online dictionary mm. um, that's been you know mm. created by your people and I think that's one way we've been able to preserve it and have access to it and it speaks back the language to mm. us. I, I would love and for every nation to be able to. And we're, we're so fortunate to have yeah. people like your nan and my dad and I used to spend my when I was a little boy I used to run around Teela's nan's house um, to be able to share that but yeah. David it, it is such a struggle to be able to keep language alive and to be able to mm. keep who we are alive. And when it comes to telling stories, we're really conscious that it is still English that drowns mm. out so many others, isn't it? Uh, yes, and that writers uh, who write in English are internationally better mm. known than writers from other cultures. One of the things that actually... So what do we do? About, do people write less? In, who, who makes room here? No, I think that it's exactly the point that was made earlier. I think that all the time we should be trying to expand the voices that we hear from. The exciting moment, in, certainly in Britain, and I imagine in most cultures, is when you hear from a voice that represents people who you haven't been hearing from. Every single breakthrough in my profession, the theatre, has come from somebody on the street telling you what it's actually like down on the street and correcting what the official culture says things are like. And news from the street is always culturally the most exciting thing because it's always the thing that blows fresh air into the culture. And one of the wonderful functions of literary festivals and the, the wonderful thing about Adelaide this year is that it's able to be international again and it's able to bring people in who you haven't heard and who it's refreshing to hear from oh, and not can from I your just, own uh, culture. Sorry, can I just weigh in yeah. just from my own experience of growing up in India, which was colonised, and the shame that we were made to carry for our own language and how we internalise that shame, because everything is in English and English is considered a superior language. And I think some of that, the process of keeping a language alive is to actually get rid of that internal shame as well and to say that our languages matter because the stories we pass on to our children, the thread that comes from our ancestors is through that language as well because that knowledge, that oral storytelling in, in our languages. And now I live in Ireland and the same process is mm. happening here, there about Irish language and my, we've just moved there from England and our small children are learning Irish there but I'm having broader conversations around how a similar conversation about Irish was kind of dying out and mm. it's now being revived. So I think what David said about um, it, being written in English, I write in English and I talk in English mm. um, and I don't write in Hindi because I think we exist in this. Again, it's about power and who has the power to make these decisions. And we are such an ethnocentric, westernized society that people who write in English are considered to be better mm. and they get more platforms. So I suppose it is about how we broaden our echo chambers so that we can um, hear more voices. Matt. I'm very fortunate to have uh, the La Perouse First Nations community in the area that I represent. And the elders there tell me that when they were at primary school or high school in days gone by, they'd get a rap over the knuckles with the ruler if they mm. spoke in yeah. their First Nations language. As a result, there's only two people left in the community that can speak the Darawal language. What a waste. What an opportunity wasted for our nation. And as you know, it's through your language, that your culture, your song lines are passed down through generations. And that's why the voice is so important. Well, that's, it's that's... about respecting the views of, the Austra of um, First Nations people and listening to them about issues like that. It certainly leads us to our next question. Lee. Mangangura, brother, thank you, and good, good luck with your work as well. Good luck with that. <laughs> no worries, mate. Next, we're going to hear from Jack Graffio. Um, thank you. My question is to Andrew Bragg. Your leader, Peter Dutton, has continued to simply state that he wants more information on The Voice, refusing to show support for what seems like a crucial step in Australia's history. 
Can you elaborate to the viewers on the specific details which the government is lacking in its proposal and also explain how the Liberal Party over the coming weeks and months will come to a formal position internally on The Voice? Well, thanks, Jack. That's a number of questions there, so I'll try and address them all. Uh, I mean, my view is that The Voice is a very good idea and I've always supported the concept. Um, obviously, now we're at the point where there's going to be a referendum. And I think it's very important that when a government wants to put a referendum to the people, that it knows what it wants to do with that power. Now, as I said before, um, my view from having travelled widely across New South Wales is that the country needs new institutions so that communities can make their own judgments about service delivery and also give advice to government. Um, and I think we need to see the detail of how that will work. Now, in simple terms, it would be how the local and regional voices will work, how the national voice will work. Uh, that's the first part of the answer. The second part, I'm trying to be as brief as I can, Stan, the second part of the answer is, look, I, I think we will come to a judgement uh, which will allow people to exercise their own view. Because historically, inside my party, whether it was on same-sex marriage or on the Republic, uh, there were yes campaigns and there were no campaigns. Now, personally, um, I would like as many people as possible to vote yes, subject to the detail being appropriate, because I think for this to win and to be successful, we need a broad base of support which transcends any political party. How much luck are you having convincing Peter Dutton? Well, I'm, I'm speaking to my colleagues. I've put a pamphlet out. Um, I'm talking to as many people as I can. I mean, the government also has to do a better job on the process here of making sure that there is actually an opportunity for bipartisan support, because that is going to be essential. I mean, uh, there is a lot of goodwill on, in our party. I mean, Julian Lee is the Shadow Minister, and mm -hmm. he's been the long-standing supporter of The Voice. So I'm hopeful this committee will be set up soon, uh, which will hopefully address those last few issues. Um, I just want to go to a news poll that's been published tonight. This information has just come in, showing support for The Voice has dropped from 56% to 53%. Now, 1,500 people were surveyed um, in that poll. So I'll go to you, Matt, on that. Does that concern you? Because we know for referendums you need double majority, don't you? Majority yeah. of people, but also majority of states. Well, we know how difficult it is to be successful in a referendum. Um, only eight of 44 have been mm. successful. Um, it does concern me somewhat because there, there may be a trend that's starting to, to exhibit there. Um, but I'd say to Why people... Why would that be? Because there's been a lot of discussion now and a lot more information coming out. Does that poll indicate that the more people are learning, the less supportive they are? I, I think you're starting to see opposition from um, people in the, in the coalition. Um, and this claim that there's more information required. Well, I'd say to people that we know that The Voice will be an independent body that will advise the government um, and the parliament. We know that it will be selected by First Nations people based on the wishes of their communities. We know that it will be empowering, it will be respectful of the views of Indigenous communities, it will be gender balanced and it will include young people. We know that it will work alongside other existing organisations. We know that it will, will not have a veto power over legislation and it won't be a service delivery model. It is about recognising people that have had a connection with this land for 65,000 years in our constitution and giving them a voice. Tila, it's yeah. as simple as that. Isn't it, isn't it, meant, to be, isn't it meant to be more than, than what Matt Thistlethwaite outlined there? More than well, just recognition? I just want to thank the young person for his question because it, it just reflects, I think, where the young people are at in wanting us to move through this really important moment in our history and, you know, wanting our political leaders to call in their own and bring the nation um, in support of this. Um, I'm going to say this. In 1967, the most successful referendum mm. in Australia's history was in relation to... Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Australians overwhelmingly voted for the federal parliament to make laws with respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The High Court subsequently said those laws can be to our benefit and to our detriment. We want a voice and a say in those laws. That is a very simple 
and a very simple proposition and a, a gift to the nation. Um, you know, another thing that I know... Could, could, could I just come in there? So, yeah. so, sorry, Taylor, that, um, just to move, we're <laughs> almost out of time, but uh, there is also, amongst our own communities, First Nations yep. communities, opposition to the voice. Mm -hmm. uh, why are we, are we seeing that? How significant do you think that is at the moment? I think that those voices um, are entitled to be heard. And I think it doesn't take away from the consensus position that was achieved at Uluru and the significance of this moment um, if we get it right. And that means a voice with power. The mandate is a First Nations voice. The current amendment that needs to be finalised must be one with power and not limiting taking away, you know, what, let, let's not talk about what it can't do, let's talk about what it can do. Mm. We want to, to improve our nation and the political process and the decisions that are made about us. So I absolutely think, you know, there is still, there is enough detail there. There will be more detail. There'll be a process before a referendum and a process after a referendum. And it's a politician's job to articulate that to the nation so that people are assured and guaranteed that when they go to the ballot box, they know absolutely what they're voting for. Can I encourage Australians to... <laughs> I'd like to encourage Australians to look up the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Have a look at the document and read those very, very powerful words in it. And as Teela's mentioned, just as important as the words in the statement are, are the 250 signatures that surround the statement. They represent every square metre of the Australian continent, First Nations representatives coming together at Uluru and speaking on behalf of their people, and their communities, speaking as one voice. It was a very generous gesture, reaching out to the Australian people and government and saying, work with us. Can Respect us and yes. work with us. And I think that's a generous offer that the Australian people should take up. And just on the final... Yeah. The final point is this. The First Nations voice will be a political voice. First Nations, vo First Nations speak with many different voices. We wake up every day having to hear the left and the right debate. I mean, we are entitled to the, to the robustness of, of the diversity of our communities. And that means the recognition of all the First Nations voices across the continent and a mm. voice with power. Now, we were talking before about the poll on this. I want to bring you the results of the poll that we've been running tonight as well, our online poll. We asked you, is it ever OK to edit an author's work as social values change? Here's the results. Well, no, overwhelmingly. So, David, how you've won that one. 13% um, <laughs> yes and unsure, 7 um, I want to finish tonight's discussion with Isabel Lamont. Isabel. I just asked this question as a privileged, older white woman. Um, given all that's happening in the world and in our country, for example, floods, fires, violence against women, disrespect for women, indigenous injustices, lack of honesty, lack of integrity, I at times feel a sense of despair for humanity. What would your priority be if you were Prime Minister to give me a sense of hope? No. And please, no political point scoring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that caveat. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to whip around in the time we've got left. So the politicians, I'll put the timer on you. But Matt, you may be Prime Minister one day. Um, you're nodding, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you do? <laughs> I think one of the greatest threats facing the world is the threat of climate change. Um, and it's something that we need as uh, humans to work together on. Um, and we're starting to make progress on it. Um, but we need to do more. And I think that humanity has shown in the past when we're faced with challenges such as that, that we can come together and work on solutions. Uh, the hole in the ozone layer, I think, was a classic example. So I think that... Uh, Humanity can come together and provide us with hope on challenges such as that. Pragya, if you were Prime Minister. <laughs> um, I think I agree climate change is a really big issue at the moment and it's about creating a better world for our children. So I'm a very optimistic person despite everything that's happening on in this world. I feel that if we all keep our mind on the fa fact that we all have our privileges and we can 
leverage our privilege to help others who don't have the same privilege, I think that's something that we can all do individually to make a better world. Andrew. Look, I think in this country it's very clear that the largest dispar disparity exists between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, and I think it's very important that we work to try and bring that to uh, a very, very, you know, very important end as soon as we can. David, because of what you've said about politicians tonight, I doubt you'd ever want to be one, but um, <laughs> if you were... <laughs> I, I asked this very question to <laughs> Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and it was very surprising. His answer was, I'd sort out the prisons. Yes. Um, yeah. And he said, mm. you, know, you know, he's dead right, because it's practical and it's something that somebody who has no political ambitions can do very easily. In Britain, we have 80,000 people in prison. Yeah. We probably have 20,000 people of those who we actually need to be defended from. Yeah. The rest of them are being dragged through a degrading and pointless system. And why no politician ever has the courage ever to do anything about pointless prisons, I really do not understand. Yeah. Thank you. The final word. I don't usually agree with white men, but I agree. Abolish <laughs> prisons. <laughs> Abolish Thank prisons. You. Thank you, Teela. That's all we have time for. Thanks again to our panel. David Hare, Andrew Bragg, Pragya Agarwal, Matt Thistlethwaite and Teela Reid. Please thank you. <laughs> thank you again for sharing your stories and questions. Um, and I want to thank the people who gave me... Um, do you like this tie? Do you like this tie? I want to thank the people who gave me this tie last week. I had the opportunity to go and meet some, some of my people, First Nations people in New South Wales who are working, trying to do good work in our communities through the police service, which is very, very difficult, as, as we know. Uh, and they gave me this, so I wore that with pride tonight. Next, I'll be with you live from Melbourne next week. Joining me, the legendary singer-songwriter and activist Billy Bragg will be here on the panel and to perform for us too. Labor member for McNamara, Josh Burns, will be with us and deputy leader of the Nationals, Perrin Davey. So head to our website to register to be in the audience. Until I see you next time, have a good night. Thank you.